So then, David, if you want to promote me to panelist, I'm in on the public link. Okay, it looks like we are good. I think I'm kicking off. All right, very good. <laughs> um, thank you for um, allowing us to talk a little bit about social emotional health uh, post COVID 19. I'm very happy to be here. Um, personally here instead of online because I have a terrible significant delay and I know that was incredibly frustrating in any presentation that I was ever involved in. My apologies. Um, so we're excited to be able to share uh, with you just a little bit of um, information about the current state of um, social emotional health and then talk a lot about what we are doing in that area. Um, so what we're going to be doing today, and I'm not driving, so I'm just going to be here. Could you guys make sure you introduce yourselves too? Sorry. So, because they may not know who you all are when you're not just a little face on the box. Would Absolutely. that be okay? <laughs> Sorry. That's, That's all right. Uh, Barbara Oland. I am a um, division administrative uh, consultant in learning and results. Uh, Barb Anderson, and I am an educational program consultant in nutrition and health services. I'm Kathy Birch, and I'm an admin consultant for MTSS, and I am glad to see you in, perfect, in, in person as well. So, uh, Brad Niebling, Bureau Chief for Learn Strategies and Supports. Thank you. Yep. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, Brad. We're going to be talking just a little bit about the current state. Uh, social emotional um, health data, and then we're going to spend a lot more time talking about our statewide supports for social emotional health, um, including MTSS and social emotional behavior health. A little bit about our conditions for learning, which wrapped up this, this last month. Um, universal behavioral <coughs> health screening and development health grants. Resources. So, before we do that, though, just wanted to point you to uh, the goal. This, this um, presentation is connected to several goals that you have on the state board. So the information that we're sharing today is connected to uh, these four goals in the area of safe, healthy, and welcoming learning environments for all kids. So uh, we, there's not a lot of <clears throat> social emotional health data for the state of Iowa because we do not actually implement any of those measures and those tools last year. Um, the Iowa Youth Survey was not administered and Conditions for Learning Survey was not administered. So we don't have a whole bunch. Uh, we did um, implement an um, ESSER 3 survey that we're looking at the results right now and don't have those to share with you. Um, but kind of anecdotally in um, well, in that survey, we asked things like, what are your priorities uh, given the pandemic and what will be your priorities in 2021 20 um, But I wanted to share with you, we have conducted um, several focus groups for a different project, uh, Iowa eLearning Central. And as we conduct those focus groups, we hear consistently two areas of concern that uh, schools, educators, parents, and students really want to uh, want us to think about resources, develop resources support. And one is accelerating learning, but the bigger area is social and behavioral health. We hear that consistently in the focus groups that hold across the state. We heard it in our October November focus groups. We heard it in our May focus groups. So it's a big area. People are very concerned about that for adults and for our students across schools and their families. Um, but uh, before we think about social emotional behavioral health, I think we need to keep in our heads at the DE and everybody who works in this area kind of the contextual factors 
that surround each individual because it's not just about that individual, it's about the whole context and community within which an individual lives. Um, the living, working, um, what they do in a leisure time, um, all those factors that impact them, the risk of protective factors and how they interact with them that really makes up the entire individual and how, uh, what their well being looks like. So we have to take into consideration things like the stability of, the, of their finances, um, their health, um, their education, um, the supports that surround them. So when we're thinking about SEDA supports within the DE, we're thinking about all those different factors and how we can mitigate or support around each individual child, schools, <coughs> educators. Does mental health fit in the healthcare system bubble? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I would say probably in the education bubble too. There's overlap there. <laughs> And it's influenced by each of those factors as well. Right? So that if you, when things are stressful, it's uh, maybe more with the health symptoms, so then things are less stressful. <clears throat> um, so we just wanted to show a little uh, bit of data here um, that we do have access to, and also um, highlight an important piece of data in that um, suicide really continues to be. Um, the second leading cause of death for our Iowa youth. And we also have an Iowa youth survey that has significant suicide ideation uh, results for um, students across the grades. Um, the orange area, the orange line, are students 15 to 19, and then the blue is uh, 14 or below. So um, we have a pretty significant. Um, um, results in that area for Iowa. Um, it's something that we need to be attendant to, <laughs> something that we need to surround our schools and our students with. These data um, are for 2020, our preliminary data though, I just wanna kind of point that out to you. So this is, it is also, um, you know, not data, maybe <clears throat> even consideration the full impact of uh, COVID-19 at this time. Uh, this is a dumb question, but are those just raw numbers, or are those, what are those numbers? Those, those are raw numbers. Of, like of, number of, of, of people. Number of, of, of deaths number of by deaths. suicide. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so as Barbara said, the, the orange line is uh, youth 15 to 19, and the blue line, and over since 2010, are the deaths per year uh, for 14 and under. Would those, would those numbers be potentially understated because of people not wanting to reveal information? Um, you know, I happen to sit on a death review data committee and I think that they would say that that is the case. Um, part of the reason why the 2020 data is still preliminary is that it takes a, a lot of time and a lot of investigation to confirm um, the, cause, the cause of death and, and, and apply uh, intent to that. Okay. Um, yeah. Is there any reason every two years it seems like there's a up and down and up and down? Is there any plausible explanation? Which is I said the election year. That might be what it is. I think that's good to. to a question to ask if you can investigate. Some of that's also graphing. It looks, you know, pretty. But it was so flat. I think that that's, no, and yeah, then that's what makes it. Kind of up and down. <laughs> there's, there's a trend there. It's an upward trend too. Yes. Yeah, it's like the stock market. Yeah. I, I think the experts in the field would agree that with, um, more efforts uh, need to happen and that what <clears throat> we need to, to make some revisions in our efforts for specific issues. <laughs> So do you think this number you said was a preliminary uh, number for 2020? Do you think it's going to go up or is it? I don't know if it will go up, but we know that it won't go down. So oh, okay. Those are the ones that are confirmed, but they're still coming. <clears throat> okay, hang on. Yeah. 2020. 2020, the, the other. <laughs> Span into 2021 yet, which is still oh, okay. partially impacted yeah, by the. Pandemic. Yeah. So okay. This isn't a full picture of the pandemic. It'll be like a hot, like a, a year, and then like. Yes. Well, I'm sure the impacts of the pandemic won't go away right now. So. Do we know the national number by chance, just in general? 
um, <laughs> the national <laughs> number of suicides. Yeah, so, so suicide um, used to be third national, and it is now is also the second cause of leading cause of death for young people yeah, nationally as well as in our. And then like number, number, the, the number national of, number of The us. national number of death. I can, I don't have it. No worries. So you, you don't have to get it. Absolutely. You don't have to get it. No, don't. It's not hard to get to, and I can get it to you. I was so, just wondering where we were. Nationally. So our expectation would be really ugly for 21, right? I mean, we're sitting here thinking. And, and don't well, know. I would expect to see significant <clears throat> numbers. I mean, unfortunately. Right. I mean, we don't know until we yeah, see, but right. at the same time, we've had an unprecedented context of stressor for everybody growing up yeah, kids and yeah. the impact that adult mental health has on kids and no, no. so we are in a unique time and environment in that regard so it, it would not be surprising if we saw that number go up but we'll have to wait and see how it actually plays out social economic suicide I mean, is there commonality is there um i I don't have that data. Um, I know that the data death, uh, violent death data committee is working to examine that and to make that information more available. Um, so there might be more information available in the fall. We don't have it at this time. Thank you. Do you have the number of youth who attempt suicide? I mean, that's probably more of a private number, but I think that might be more reflective. We have accurate information on the Iowa Youth Survey on suicide ideation. Yeah, and I know I've been coming through the past data, but there's <clears throat> so little through the pandemic that everything mm -hmm. is so behind. So, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I mean, the numbers don't look good yeah. for um, the students who have thought about suicide. Oh, yeah. Yep, oh, Robert. Just last week, we had a webinar all the national data mm -hmm. and how the national mm -hmm. experts, I'll email you the link that you can watch it. It has oh, all the national reports and <clears throat> across all the states. Thank you. We're, we're going to get into the meat of what we're doing um, to support um, state law now. Um, and as we transition to that, we transition to American <clears throat> Cafe to provide all the details of um, all the different projects that we're engaged in. So we're going to be talking about um, okay, um, we're going to be talking about these. Mm -hmm. um, so although um, the data, we don't have a specific data for the past year as, as we might like, we know that there is still a lot of work to be done around social emotional uh, behavioral health statewide. And so um, we know that um, uh, multi tier system of supports is our framework for, uh, for every educational decision making um, holistically, both academically uh, as well as social emotional behavioral health. And we have used that to inform uh, our work. Uh, we know that the board um, has heard uh, previously updates on the Senate file 2360 and the guidance that was uh, developed last fall. We have continued that work um, in writing administrative rules um, uh, that live in uh, school, uh, Chapter 14 School Health Services. Uh, they are not final yet, um, but they are in process and getting close. Uh, so the, the um, items that you see um, uh, bulleted up there um, all are, are summary points of the uh, part of the rules that focus on um, the outline of professional learning that we will be developing over the next year uh, in consultation with our area education agency to support educators in implementing those rules. And we, we approach that within the MTSS framework. Um, so you'll note, just to, uh, to highlight some of those, um, we want it to, to be founded in culturally uh, and trauma responsive practices. Uh, we know that um, uh, proactive strategies and early intervention uh, minimize the escalation of behavioral symptoms that may result. Um, uh, we, we know that if we intervene early, that the outcomes are gonna be better. And we also really wanna focus um, uh, on providing supports around family engagement, um, supporting parents and guardians to be educational partners in supporting your child's success. Um, as Barbara had mentioned, we also conducted the uh, Conditions for Learning survey. 
and that uh, administration window is April 5th through May, uh, through May 20th of this year. Uh, the student surveys were administered um, in grades three through 12. And this year, it was, uh, well, there was an opportunity for parent and school staff surveys. They were not required, um, but they were an option uh, to provide additional data for schools. And um, we also, she also mentioned that surveys were not conducted in 2020. I have uh, received a lot of calls actually on when is the condition for learning data going to be available? So I know that the schools are really eager to have that, that data to help them inform uh, and improve conditions for learning. And then um, I had mentioned chapter 14. Uh, in addition to uh, the professional learning that is a part of the administrative rules, we also, it also addresses uh, rules for uh, school behavioral health screenings and telehealth, and that was by the Senate file 2261. It allows for mental health professionals um, to provide telehealth <clears throat> well with children at school. We have had previously had school-based mental health services in person. Telehealth is an expansion that reduces barriers and increases access. Um, we, it also allows schools to contract with mental health professionals uh, to provide um, on-site behavioral mental health screenings. And the department is going to be working with, uh, in consultation with uh, the Department of Human Services and <coughs> Public Health to develop approved um, measures um, for screening with parent permission. Um, I'll pause there in case anybody has any questions before we turn it over to Kathy. Are you finding enough mental health providers? You know, yeah. put on that list, I mean, <laughs> yeah. like that, especially. Yes, well, we are 44th in the nation, which yeah. is actually up, but we have huge needs, as you know. Yeah. Um, I do believe that telehealth is a wonderful opportunity yeah. for the areas, and so well, that's, that's, a great focus. that's a great question. So um, will districts be able to use any of their um, pandemic money to support these mental health Contracts. Yes, and Kathy is going to talk about that. Yes. So, let's think of what good setup. <laughs> exactly. Um, yes, yeah, so we have several grants um, and resources yeah. that um, uh, that we put in place to support districts in implementing the mental health supports and social emotional behavioral health supports as well. Uh, the first one I'm talking about briefly is the therapeutic classroom grant. I think I've been here to talk about that one before. It um, it has now uh, closed and it's a 1.6 million dollar grant. And it's an incentive grant to support schools in developing therapeutic classrooms uh, to support mental health development, um, uh, skill building for social emotional learning. Um, targeted uh, targeted instruction to support uh, individual mental health needs, and uh, we are in an appeal window right now. So we, while we have announced those initial grant uh, recipients, we're we're just still in that window. So we're we're hoping to be able to uh, work with them starting next week um, as as that appeal window closes. What does a therapeutic classroom look like? A therapeutic classroom? Yeah, you know, that is a, per a really good question. We have lots of questions about that. And in fact, um, the, uh, the chapter 14 that Barb mentioned, um, we've outlined more specifically the components, right, that you want to see in a therapeutic classroom. Um, I can't say, is it that it is a place where kids go or a many places where kids go? And it's really dependent on what kids need, right? And so in, for some kids, it is a place where they go, right? And they might have time in the day where they're working on uh, social emotional learning skills that are very specific to them and their, their mental health needs, uh, like coping skills and self-management. Um, they might uh, be working with a contract and mental health provider during some of that time, depending on what schools have set up. Um, they'll all have behavior intervention plans that's required by code. So meaning that Everybody has. Everybody knows the plan for a child, and um, are trained and uh, implement that plan. And it meets the and it's intended for both students with and without disability. So it's not just a classroom in a school. But it is a school building where therapeutic services are provided. Yep, it's supports. That, yeah, it's supports. It's a set of supports in a school, and yeah. um, and it's the school really works to identify what those supports are based on their student Good. needs. Thank you. Yeah. So as part of this funding, does it allow the schools the ability to also be working with the parents or guardians of the 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's a required component that they involve parents in decision making, um, either you know as part of an IP or as part of a, a general education plan as well. So, um, and those are again those more defined components of therapy classroom. Those are are what we have defined for rules uh, that we're writing right now and, and in that rules writing process. So, yeah. So, it's, can I do this math real quick? So, one point six million divided by one hundred and fifty. That's on ten thousand thousand dollars per kid yep about mm -hmm. what wow yeah uh and so it's and we have about six districts that those funds will be divided across uh to support them as an incentive to really develop these supports and it's across uh five AAs and five of our mental health uh, mental health uh delivery service areas as well so it's spread out across the state and is, is it just for a school year or over a course of their yeah it's a one-time upfront grant so um, there are other uh, components within legislation that allow for some reimbursement for uh, students who are who don't already have a waiting through I through an IP so schools can uh, work to maintain their program through that reimbursement um, which is uh, in code as well so, so beyond the grant when you guys come back like maybe in three months or so whenever you guys come back those 150 kids will they be able to be able to can we say hey they're stable they what results should we yeah. see so um some of the some of the districts um i'm just thinking about where they're at in their development right so some districts are starting from ground zero meaning they really have to build the knowledge and skills of their teachers and staff to support students um so uh they may uh, have students enter a little bit further into the school year, um, and some are ready to start doing professional learning right now with their teachers and such. But uh, the goal would be that students have the mental, the, the, the coping skills, the social emotional learning competencies to really handle uh, the stressful situations that kids, uh, kids have and can engage in those practices in a variety of settings, including their age typical settings. So we'll track them, you guys, are, or you know, monitor or give us a result. Or yeah, we have uh, like a pre some pre post measures for the okay. development for the program development. Thank you. So the 150 students may not be the same students throughout the entire year. It could be one student starts, goes for a semester, or whatever, another student. Correct. Okay. Yep. Exactly. And, and, and then, that that is with an assessment. Is there some sort of assessment that will happen? do this and now we're going to evaluate this program or is it they're responsible do you have a yeah the programs will have an implementation measure that we're asking them to use so meaning they they self-assess themselves already okay. and then we'll ask them to self-assess again on how well they've developed their components of their program okay. and then we also have some statewide reporting data that we're required to collect um, regarding referrals to therapeutic classrooms and use of therapeutic classrooms and all of that data. Um, well. I think at some point we'll be able to scale this up so that uh, it serves more than 150 kids and you know six AEA districts. Yeah, potentially. Um, if we scroll to the next one, um, <clears throat> actually, these are yeah, these are the districts right now that right. we announced that we're in that waiting period. But if you go one more, Brad. Um, we also have a set of resources through, uh, we call it GEAR 2, it's the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, and this is uh, $8.6 million to develop and support students' mental health needs in schools, and um, we anticipate, and it's somewhat, it depends on what districts ask for, we have 130 applicants for this grant, um, and we anticipate we should be able to uh, provide resources for about 70 of those. Uh, that's an estimate, and it really depends on what they ask for. We might be able to be able to provide more, um, but when we think about more opportunities for more districts, um, while this is a therapeutic classroom, and many of the types of supports are the same kinds of supports, right? Um, mental health, uh, so service coordination, so uh, mental health uh, service delivery, collaboration with <laughs> community agencies to support uh, to support mental health treatment, um, suicide yeah, prevention, yeah, suicide yeah. prevention uh, involving youth uh, and reducing stigma, reducing barriers mm -hmm. uh, to, to service, but also um, mental health um, training. Um, so Betty's is the right question, but I have the opposite question. <laughs> 
what happens when this is the money's gone? Yeah. Is is this? I mean, are we hiring people to deliver this, or are these people that are getting education to add it to, to another service? Or I mean, is this all just going to stop? So there's probably a bit of a difference between the therapeutic classrooms question yeah. and that question for that versus uh, the brief. million five versus the eight six right. or a million. Eight whatever it was, six, I guess. There are some ongoing resources for students served through a therapeutic classroom. So for a student who does not have a weighted IEP, meaning that they aren't getting, we aren't getting extra, the school isn't getting extra funding for them, uh, the district can submit for reimbursement at a 1.5 weighting. So it's like 7,000 times okay. 25, right? So <clears throat> one and a half times that. Um, that's granted, that's not a ton of money, right? But it does help support the support students with additional needs um, as part of, and that's what legislated uh, meeting staff to provide the service to the students. It could support or salaries. It, else? it could support uh, contracts with mental health providers. It could okay. support training for teachers. Yeah, any. Of so it's all in the nature of a service. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. Was it this bill that um, there was also the ability for um, contributions? into that pot of yeah. money that aren't Absolutely. necessarily through like <laughs> foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Foundations. Mm -hmm. yeah. So foundation. <laughs> so that's the oh, okay. ways to right. populate that pot of money sure. other than legislative like, appropriation. Or right. take corporate dollars. I believe yep. so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And both of those um, funding opportunities really did encourage schools to think about graded funding and uh, expanded partnerships to sustain, for sustainability and capacity building. Yeah, and I would, I, you know, and this is anecdotal, and Barb can probably uh, uh, kind of reflect on it too, but I was, even in the first round of reviews, I was highly surprised at the number of school districts that are already collaborating with mental health providers. Um, for for uh, for services for their students, uh, so it's it's already at a high number at, at a really high number at least for the ones that we buy. Right? Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, theoretically, at some point, you'd want to see those kinds of supports in every building in every district. And I realize you have to <laughs> pilot projects or whatever, but you know, it's a big task. There are there are always um, inherent challenges with time bound allocations right, uh, in terms uh, of sustainability. Yeah. Um, I think that's why they built in that mechanism for like foundation money or otherwise to help with the therapeutic classrooms. Okay. Oftentimes districts uh, get into partnership agreements with each other. So a student in a district maybe that doesn't have a therapeutic sure. classroom could actually go to one uh, district. So there, there are ways to expand the reach <laughs> geographically. Um, but that doesn't get to a full scale solution. You know, yeah. right? There are also ways to build internal capacity to provide some of the supports that students need, right? Through through some of the treatment approaches that are more school based educational approaches, but still support mental health. What did the what did the state legislature do with oh, the mental health issue? There's something about shifting away from counties to it's a fun case. Well, okay. okay. Yeah. Well, and and. Maybe some other good details. Yeah, yeah. The funding went more towards it will be an appropriation from the legislature <laughs> having to be funded by the county. So that shifts, um, I think, capacity a little bit, um, and maybe will help us move more towards um, increasing the level of services. The, the other thing too is that um, when you talk about the sustainability, with some of this single money, and there's going to be more. I mean, obviously, this is going to be a continued priority of the department. We'll have more information on this. Is the the training capacity, facility changes that can help make it get you farther down the roads than the ongoing costs are lessened because <clears throat> the braided funding, the partnerships, the mental health, we don't want to just have teachers do more. We're not trying to just put more on schools, but this idea that we're all working together shouldn't just be a concept. It should be how we do business. And this jump starts us. Um, farther down the road to make sure we keep doing that. It doesn't, we have the capacity to keep yeah. it going. Well, the reason why I asked the question about the funding and if there's any flexibility with that, about six years ago, I visited our county health person and I said, what funding is available for school age kids? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. So I'm assuming, has that changed at all or? Well, well, for the next three years, it's changed because <laughs> there's a lot available for this. There is, and you know, so here's another slide too, but districts can also use some of their SO3 dollars to help provide social, emotional, behavioral health supports, resources, and services. Um, 
it, and and it's not just education that has money, it's DHS that has money and it's it's workforce that has money. So there are pots of money. And so part of this process of how are we most effectively using these funds is all these partners, as we look at what could we do and these conversations are happening, if we can each pull from that, that money, we can get a lot farther down the road. Changes legislatively are a little more permanent ongoing, but if we solely relied on that, we couldn't jumpstart it quite as fast. So when you take what we are able to provide, which DHS is able to provide, changes legislatively that offers like the telehealth and those different options, um, we're gonna be able to do a lot more in a shorter amount of time. All that being said, you still need the people to do it. And that might still be the, the part that we have to address. And I wonder here too, um, as we, this afternoon in a little bit, transition to the conversation around mm -hmm. priorities and goals, what we highlight at the beginning here is that we think this fit aligns with the goals that you have around creating mm -hmm. safe, healthy, and welcoming learning environments. But I wonder if this is part of a continued conversation as we talk about what that priority and, and those goals to think about um, how you as a board want to, to pursue this work around social, emotional, behavioral health and, and safe learning environments. Because uh, talking about this stuff all day, yeah. several days, right? there's a lot of really important work here. We're really passionate about it, and I know you all are too. So maybe we can continue some of that conversation as we're getting into your priorities and goals later this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Just on the to close the loop on the property tax part. So yeah. the property tax levy was very specific as where those dollars went to, and now that that's gone and it's gone to the state level, they could allocate more towards children's mental health. Correct. Right. Whereas before that wasn't happening. So it allows more flexibility because the levy's gone and now it's come to a pot at the state level. Yeah. Thank you. Any last questions for us for now? And this will be the last conversation we have on this because it does tie into what we'll talk about with our priorities for CARES dollars, your priorities for board work. You're gonna, you're gonna see this again and again um, because it's an example of something that was already there that were, was exacerbated and we know we need to pay more attention to it and we have an opportunity to really do something different. Oh, just a, maybe a parting comment. I, I see this as extremely important work. Mm -hmm. yep. and the bottom line is if, if kids are not in a good mental state, it doesn't matter what interventions you're going to put forth in the mm -hmm. classroom as far as to catch them up to speed with reading or math skills. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I have a statistic to share with you all, like after so 4-H did a survey, a national survey of all the students who were in 4-H, and more students feel pressured to hide their feelings and their emotions when they're upset or frustrated or feeling depressed than they do when they feel pressured to take drugs or to drink alcohol. So that's like 67%. And then over 70% of students, when they are feeling depressed or anxious, they spend more time alone and do not reach out to anybody. So when when they are having those feelings where they can easily slide into a bad mental health state and go into like suicidal idealization, they spend more time alone rather than reaching out and making the connections that they need to be healthy. And so that's why it's so important that those supports where it's teachers and where adults in the schools are reaching out to them are there and available at school because students, they don't know how to reach out and do that on them by themselves yet. So you're really highlighting such a critical mean you've done it all day in previous <clears throat> meetings too. The importance of student voice in this conversation. So we aren't doing two, but doing yeah. that and figuring out what's going to be the most helpful. Yeah. I appreciate that reflection. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That is shocking. And the students are out. Yes, I went and talked with them, but yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll go this way. <laughs> Brad, you'll need to stop sharing, please. Well, you don't tell me to stop sharing. You tell me I need to Right, so I need to fill that one out. <laughs> Did Anne serve? 
Was Anne here when Angela and Mike and Mary Ellen were here? So are they going to sit here? Okay, <laughs> whatever. She can still sign the card. <laughs> Where you want the students to sit? Do we want them right here? Yeah, that'd be great. Sorry. I guess I should have thought about chairs. What? How many chairs? I don't know. I, I mean, if can we, um, and maybe if, we, if they need to scoot back a little bit to give more room or whatever, that's fine. I don't know how, how are you guys okay? Is this okay? Yes. Okay. I'll make sure everyone's comfortable. All right. Sign. Huh? These, these are cards for them. For Mike and Angela have, oh, and oh, okay. you guys find if I sit back here and Josh and with their presence, obviously we're only going to give it to Mike tonight, but whatever. And everyone signed Jody's except for. Can you? Did you sign a card for? Jody? Yes. Okay. And Kim, you didn't. You signed the card for Jody, and I think we're good. Uh, this was the last person, right? Okay. All right. I'm going to take my mask off for this. I started you with the cards I had already. Oh, thanks. Okay. I just realized that you didn't. Weren't here when they were here. <laughs> I don't know any of them. Should I sign it anyway? You, you can sign it. I mean, I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> but yeah, I was like, oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> okay. So I will have all the questions for you guys up behind you. So just feel free to swivel around if you forget what the question is. Can have them introduce themselves? Yes, yes. So we are going, this is the student panel. I apologize, we do not have any boys. The one boy who is from rural Iowa had a family medical emergency today, so he unfortunately could not make it. But we have an amazing panel of all of these girls here today um, who are super excited to share their experience um, in school with you all. And I know that today we've realized how important the student voice is. And so this is an opportunity to really listen to them, um, to hear what they have to say, because this, this experience is very unique and um, something that only these students have had since they're in high school in the middle of a global pandemic. So we'll start off with introductions. There's the four questions that I think are the most essential for us to answer that I put at the beginning of the presentation. But then after that, feel free to hop in and like ask questions along the way if something they say really resonates with you and you wanted to follow up on that. So we'll start with introductions. Um, we're gonna do name, grades, school, and what kind of model of learning you were in throughout the year. Hi, my name is Aubrey. I go to Lincoln High School and I'm an upcoming senior. Yeah, oh, and I had the, I was fully online this year despite having the option to go back to school. Okay. Um, I am Anya. I go to Norwalk and I will be a sophomore this year and I was fully in person. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Arushi Gupta. I go to Johnson High School. I'm going to be a junior next year. And um, I went from hybrid to online to in person. Wow. Hi, my name is Sam. I just recently graduated as a senior from Roosevelt High School here in Des Moines. Um, and throughout my entire senior year, I was fully virtual, even though I also had the choice to go back. Okay. All right, awesome. So the first question we start is pretty general and broad. In what ways was your education impacted by, by COVID? So for me, um, being online, I really struggled with the visual learning kind of thing. That's my best way of learning. So in being online and not having that teacher contact, um, I struggled in that way because I have a short attention span in that kind of factor. <laughs> so sitting at home at my computer is just kind of like, okay, teachers continuing on. They're just, they're doing the lesson as they should be doing, but it, they there's no reason, there's no way for them to be like, oh, are you paying attention? Like, yeah, they had those questions and stuff, but there is no kind of incentive, I guess. It's like, I'm just there. It doesn't really, yes, I like, did well in class, but I just didn't feel like I was being, um, I, could, I could have done better. That's essentially what it is. I could have done better if I were, if there was a better learning model for the online. I have a question. Sorry, this is probably a really stupid question, but so if you were online, was there, were you like on a camera here and then the rest of the class is in person or was there like a separate class for online? Does that make sense? Yeah, for me, there is a separate class for online and in person, and then you didn't have to have your camera on. Um, our classes oh. didn't require that. It was like teachers that highly encouraged it, which I did turn mine on because that helped me stay um keep my attention on the teacher mm -hmm. but it wasn't uh it wasn't mandatory so we just sat on our laptops at home like in my room let's say at my desk mm -hmm. and I just would write on my notes or just sit there. Okay. Thank you. Hi, 
Um, for me, it was because our school changed learning models so much. Um, so when we were hybrid, we had a different, or I guess, so the way my school did it was that the in-school learning was based on the regular curriculum. It was slightly altered because of COVID, but um, the online version was a completely different online curriculum. So kids who were online in biology weren't doing the same, uh, weren't doing the same things as the kids who were in person in biology. And so um, when we went from hybrid, uh, what we had was like two days of in-person and three days of online. And so it was so weird to have to do one curriculum at school and then do the online version the next three days and then go back. So it was like trying to process two curriculums at the same time. And um, yeah, and also the kids who were online, I have no idea how they managed to um, like get all their work done because half of the teachers stopped using the online um like for example the uh, ap teachers didn't like how the online curriculum was different so halfway through the year they just ditched it and had the kids join the regular mm -hmm. curriculum and so we've had to switch curriculum so many times and in so many ways um and that just really affected motivation to try and um even ability to actually do it um I had a pretty different experience than both of them since I was in person the whole year, and a majority of our classes were fully in person. It was not really not. Yeah. And so we had only like a few classes that had like they had like a camera for the online kids to be there, and that was my band and choir. So it wasn't really like an online curriculum that would be separate for them to do is more or less just go and look in class and do the assessment from home but most of our classes were like the curriculum didn't change too much because they were able to do it separately for for the online students and so I had not a normal year because like it was a lot harder because of missing a lot of last year but it wasn't as significantly impacted. Um, I think the biggest factor that kind of impacted my school year, especially as a senior, was my advanced, advanced placement courses. Um, it was extremely difficult. Uh, my school district, DMPS, chose to do nine week terms. Um, and so mm -hmm. I had never done something like that before. So in nine weeks, uh, we were given a lot of AP like curriculum, a lot of new information, um, as well as like tests for regular grades. Um, and it was kind of jarring, like every nine weeks to be learning completely different courses, to be taking breaks from AP classes for up to 18 weeks. Like I could have an AP course my first term and then my fourth term and never see my teacher or my classmates in between that. And that was really hard to navigate. So I would say that that was very, very difficult and a direct result of learning virtually. Hmm. All right, so the next question, this one is, how would you describe your social and emotional state pre, during, and post COVID? Mm -hmm. We all know that social and emotional well-being was kind of disrupted. You just gave part of the answer. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> what was your experience? Was it, was it disrupted or was it not disrupted? That was my was was bad moderator. I was a bad moderator. Yes. All right. You know, regardless of what my answer was, what was your guys' experience during COVID? And how was, how was that different than before or after? Or the same? Um, I guess for me, I have my social kind of experience was detrimental just because I was in class with these kids let's say English for example I loved my AP lit class but I hadn't met a single one of them the entire year despite wanting to like kind of engage with them which I respect like being online I chose to be online but there was kind of um uh there's just some kind of obstacle there that I couldn't necessarily form any relationships this year despite being online like I could but they weren't as deep as they could have been. Um, also, emotionally, I was just like, it, with the nine week terms, that was probably the most emotionally distressed I've ever been in my high school career, despite going to in high school for a year and a half. <laughs> but uh, with the nine week terms, we were doing a semester in nine weeks. And AP chemistry, one of the hardest 
AP classes, I struggled so badly because we would do the nine weeks, then you'd get a break and then you'd have to go back to it and backtrack so that you could remember it. And it was, it was, I cried a lot. <laughs> oh my God. It was, it was really rough. Did they change AP exams when those were given? Because aren't the ex AP exams usually given at the end of the year or the school year or is it the end of the semester? Or? They did allow us to have different time slots. So there were three or four like waves, I would call them, of AP sections because for me, I took APUSH this year. I didn't finish the APUSH curriculum until after the first week of AP testing that occurred. So I took it the final week in June because I wanted to get the full curriculum without, oh, yeah. uh, you know, missing this last section of it where I was most likely tested over. I did you do labs? I didn't. So there were no labs. I, I watched a video once yeah. and then <laughs> didn't do a single one after that. Okay, cool. So I opted out of the AP chemistry test because I was like, you asked me about a lab process. So I don't know. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so I would say my social, social state <laughs> was the most like affected because I am pretty involved in like out activities outside of school. And so we weren't allowed to like have get togethers with our teams or do like team dinners. And like, we weren't supposed to go outside of our bubble, especially at the beginning of the year. And so it was really hard to be able to get to know your teammates and like become a group who can like be there for each other when we weren't allowed to like do things and bond as a team. And so it was really hard to be able to like get those bonds and create those relationships throughout the seasons because we weren't like allowed to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I guess um, socially it was just pretty horrible because um, there was like no sense of community at all at my school this year um, like uh, normally at, towards the end of the year and even at the beginning like there wasn't homecoming games and there wasn't the homecoming dance and all of that obviously couldn't have happened because of the pandemic, but like um, those things usually create a sense of community that just wasn't there the whole year. And like normally the last day of school is like this huge thing and everyone's really excited, but like half the kids were just online and they just closed their computer and that was it. That's how they graduated. And um, the other half, like we just left, like there wasn't really a huge um, sense of any togetherness um, and then emotionally it was just um, I guess with quarantine it was pretty horrible because uh, you can't really see anyone so you're just by yourself all the time so that kind of um, stresses you out and then when school started you still can't um, see people because we were hybrid so it was like I couldn't see half of my friends and we had like five kids in a class um, because we were trying to social distance and so um, emotionally, it was just really stressful the whole time because it just felt like there wasn't anyone to talk to. Um, and like, if I needed help, then I couldn't really go to anyone because no one else really understood what was going on either. Um, and then like she said with the labs, there just weren't that many labs. And uh, we had to watch videos sometimes, or sometimes we had like online labs, which is like the computer does it for you. You just like move your mouse but like then I didn't learn anything about procedures. Yeah I think what was really difficult is um, that DMPS chose to create like a virtual campus and so um, for a lot of my courses I had teachers from uh, the north side of Des Moines from the east side of Des Moines um, and that would have been fine. I really enjoy meeting new people and new teachers um, but I felt like a really low sense of connection. Uh, because I didn't know who to reach out to. I had never met these teachers before, and it was hard to build community in the classroom, especially since it was virtual. Um, I think it was also really difficult, like as a senior class, for us to like feel proud about graduating. Um, because when we came together for graduation, for some of us, like that's the first time I've seen them since freshman year. Like it has been such a long time, not just because of COVID, but um, just other factors that uh, we just have all kind of drifted apart. Um, and especially in like the post pandemic.
in the world. So there's not a lot of community among like our class. And I, I really worry about our junior class as well because they've lost uh, a lot of valuable time together. Can you guys each tell me, and I know you said there was one rural district that will you can maybe tell me earlier, but what's your, like your graduating class size? What would it be? Each of you tell me that, please. Uh, it's big. <laughs> I don't, I honestly, have no idea. like, I haven't been with my class since probably my freshman year, just because of all the freshmen to act like yourself when you obviously. But you're both Des Moines. Yeah. So I'm a junior, though. So what was yours? It's got to be around 900. Yeah, yeah is that a lot? Oh, wow. Close to 1,000, yeah. something like that. Yeah, my class was much smaller. We started around 500, and then um, I think by graduation, it was like 480 or something. Okay. Yeah. What about you guys? Um, I would say go to Johnston, so between 300 and 500. I think mine is between 270 and 300. Yeah, yeah. and Norwalk's growing a lot. Like, my class has 230 kids. Her class, a grade, two grades younger than me, has almost 300. And then the person who can be here, do you know, have any idea how big his school was? 50 was in his grade. Gotcha. So, um, and I know that, like, dealing with masks and stuff throughout the year was also really interesting to navigate um in those schools it looks like Aubrey and Anya you guys had a big reaction to that so <laughs> I saw your eyes like Whoa. <laughs> it was so ridiculous so I was doing AP testing a few weeks ago I was doing the Spanish AP Spanish test and that was at the time where the Reynolds said it wasn't mandatory to wear masks in schools which I was like okay like you have the choice to do it like the kids were walking around taking off people's masks that were wearing them, like throwing them away, mm -hmm. or like just running around. There was a they interrupted our AP test to go over the announcements and say it's okay for you not to wear your mask, but if you're going like you're allowed to wear it, but don't take that take that choice away from other people. Mm -hmm. like, Oh, it's disgusting, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so how many of you just lost your activities? Could play football, could play volleyball. Did, did that happen? In, it, it, probably not at Norwalk, right? No, we didn't. Okay. I don't think we lost any activities. But the downtown you know, schools did, right? You didn't play football. You didn't play volleyball. You didn't. We had part of the swim season. So Ian and I are on the same swim team. We had like the first two meets, and then we had our championship meets. So I went with what is a three month uh, sports season. It was two, some in August, some in November. Yeah. Oh. And we didn't really get to have contact with our coach during that time period either. And so when you're talking about these adults who have are the supporters, like the caring adults that students have connections with in school, when those activities were shut down and we were out of the school building, we lost complete connection with them because he couldn't come to our practices. We have a free school kind of agreement between mm -hmm. Carlisle, Norwalk, and Lincoln for our swim team. So because Lincoln shut down, only Lincoln swimmers weren't allowed to participate in swimming or in those tri sports, mm -hmm. whereas Norwalk and Carlisle were still able to continue with under the coaches. Um, kind of watch, but the Lincoln swimmers were not allowed to have any contact with him. Mm -hmm. uh, it would go against IHSAA uh, rules if we were to. Um, and then I'm, I'm on a uh, cheer team. And so we were sh we had to split our squads in half. Um, and this is for the varsity games. So these were like the bigger ones. The games still happen, but um, like oftentimes, uh, you know, if, if a football player got sick, then um, entire, the entire cheer squad and the football team wouldn't be able to um, go anymore. And so oftentimes we already had like, I'm not making sense. We already had like five, uh, five person cheer teams. And then when like two or three of them were gone, there was like two people cheering. And so one time we had one girl who'd never cheered in her life. We just had her put on a cheer uniform and cheer with them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for me, I uh, attend a dance studio in Urbandale, and obviously when the whole state was affected, um, that studio closed for quite a bit of time, and it was uh, right before our recital for the year, um, so we had people like dancing in their living rooms, I think I danced on my back deck, and we were all on the Zoom, I, I couldn't see anyone else, the timing was awful, we couldn't hear the music, um, it was really, really difficult, um, and then we've kind of worked towards more of a hybrid model, so if you need a Zoom link, then that's an option, um, but most folks are back in the studio now, but we did lose a lot of time on a lot of other sports. 
Yeah. Anya. I didn't lose any sports. Yes. <laughs> I was there. I guess our volleyball, we had to move to 6 a.m. practices because we couldn't all be in the same gym. And so I got up at 5 a.m. every morning. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so, Dan, I don't want to jump ahead. There's no, go ahead. So, what hurt the most? I mean, what you lost hurt you emotionally as well as maybe, I, I, but emotionally especially, what hurt the most? What would you lose? Um, I feel like I lost like my sense of me, especially during quarantine before school. Um, you know, for like months on end, being completely. Um, you know, in my room, closed off, and especially when you're a teenager, normally with, you're with your friends all the time, so to have that taken away from you, you feel like you kind of lose your own identity, and that in school, when half of the um, clubs are shut down, and half the, um, I don't know, it just feels like you lost your identity when everything's shut down, and half of the things aren't there. I'm a very persistent person and I found myself giving up a lot. Mm -hmm. So when swimming shut down or it was like about to shut down during a rally meet, we didn't know. And I was just like, let it shut down. Like, I'm so done with this. Like, mm -hmm. I would rather go to my club and do that than have a swim season that might be cut off. Even in classes, I was like, I really want to continue doing this for four years in college. Mm -hmm. Like, because our teachers would say, this is this is what college is like these nine weeks. Mm -hmm. Which, like, I hated it. I'm like, no, I don't want to do this anymore. But I do. But it was just back and forth the entire time. I think for me, more or less, just kind of loose. Everybody talks about how high school is this really awesome thing and how you're like, you get so many new experiences. And I was going into high school into, as a pandemic. And so, like, you kind of lost all those fun, like, activities that they would do. And we weren't able to have a dance that ninth graders could go to. And so it was just kind of like, you hear about all these experiences that people had, but you weren't able to experience them yourself. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. I know we aren't following your- No, that's totally fine. Sorry. I feel like this is a better discussion this way anyway, honestly. <laughs> Mike asked what hurt the most? What did you lose that really hurt? Is there anything you can point to that you feel like you gained because of your, the unique learning experiences this year? I definitely learned that um, I, did, I get distracted easily. So I learned different ways to adapt to be able to focus on the teacher, which it really helped. Like what I think we could do in the future is we could have recordings of the lessons that we can go back and watch. Mm -hmm. There's my struggle in math mm -hmm. sometimes. I would go back at the end of the day after my classes and would go down and write notes mm. and do the working problems that maybe I spaced off during. That was something that I thought was really helpful and that I hope next year we can maybe implement into our normal school life. Um, I would say I think the one thing I gained was I ended up towards the end of the year eating lunch with one of I guess I didn't even have her as a teacher, but one of the teachers that was next to my advisory class. And so I was able to kind of gain, cause she had a different view of everything than I did obviously. And so I was kind of able to gain her, like how she had saw part of it and how she was experiencing things. Cause she was also moving classrooms cause our school is going through reorganization next year. And so I, we were kind of able to share like what was going on like with the pandemic and how like she was somebody I knew I could like turn to. And so that was something I thought I would gain. Um, I think I gained a lot of emotional intelligence. Um, it sounds bad when you're like, you know, if you're when your mental health is really low and it seems like a bad thing, but that also means that um, you know, you gained a lot of emotional intelligence trying to claw yourself out of the hole. Mm. And so I gained a lot of insight onto, into like the way I think and what works for me and what doesn't. Um, and I also learned how to let things go because before COVID, I was insanely stubborn. And, um, you know, if, if a club would have, you know, stopped or something, I would have probably, you know, gone to the principal and been, been like, you got to start this up again or something like that. And I used to, yeah, I used to go after like every little thing, but after COVID, I've kind of like 
accepted that things happen and things don't go your way. That's okay. I think I've gained um, an intense amount of empathy. I think um, even though it was very difficult to learn from home, I was not struggling with food insecurity. I was not living through poverty. I, I did not have an IEP. Um, I had access to internet and technology and that helped me greatly. I also had like English and communication skills to speak with teachers. And so I think like I have matured so much and been able to recognize my own privilege just because I have seen so many students struggle, um, especially with like, like our current uh, learning models or lack thereof. So um, I think that's what I get. Thank you. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Cause I think you mentioned, I think it was you, your class size was 500 something, but by the time you graduated, it was less. Do you know where those students went? Um, I think um, there, there was quite a few uh, that graduated early. Mm -hmm. um, some students drop out, some students transfer. Um, I, I don't necessarily know because it, it is quite a big school. Okay. Mm -hmm. But maybe a combination of some of that really. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that was a tricky question, sorry. One of the questions I have that isn't necessarily directly related to education, but is sort of linked is, did this make a difference in your future plans? Like how? I mean, Aubrey, you mentioned like college and how you think about it differently now because of your experience at DMPS, but maybe necessarily like what field you want to go into. Did any of that change or do you still feel pretty set on what your future looks like and what kind of values you hold for the future? Definitely had to step back and reevaluate what I wanted to do. So at one point I wanted to be like a forensic pathologist. I hate chemistry. I can't do it for the life of me. If I have to continue doing it online, I'm never like, I cannot do that. So I stepped back and I was like, okay, what, what do I actually enjoy? What has been either taken away from me because of this pandemic or what have I been able to explore throughout this? And in doing that, I learned, I taught myself how to operate a CAD software. So I have been exploring architecture and architectural design, that kind of stuff, or going into some sort of like coaching position because I love swimming so much. Like that's so fun. So I got a job doing coaching, doing little little kid lessons. Hmm. So doing that, in doing that, I did find kind of where I want to go, getting like internships, all of that kind of stuff. But it's still iffy just because I don't know. I haven't been in person to explore these kinds of things because I haven't been able to. Would you hate chemistry if you were in person taking it? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that. I, I tried taking chemistry in college and I, I went there and I went to the uh, registrar's uh, office. And after a month, I was like, I cannot do this. Thank you. Chemistry is <laughs> great. It's just it just more. It's not, I was just, maybe it just didn't click with me. I don't know the numbers kind of stuff. But this year, it just was really like, you cannot do this if it's like online. I tried so hard to get paid in that class. Like, I was crying. At, uh, I was coming in after the state meet before surgery, and I was like doing my notes because I had to do a test at, at midnight. Yeah. I was like, oh. I still got a B. Like, I oh, good. I think partially, I really wanted to be a nurse for a while. And my sister is a nurse and she's been a nurse throughout the pandemic. And so I think just kind of seeing not only kind of what she like had to go through, which was like really hard on her. And I just kind of saw her kind of like turn her back away and like just start distancing herself from people just because it was really stressful so I think just kind of seeing that and then also at the end of for through probably three quarters of our second semester we were kind of transferred to an online setting in person because our teacher had to go on maternity leave and they couldn't find a sub that was qualified for science and so I think just kind of that got really hard because I specifically transferred away from the teacher who ended up like teaching our class remote because it just worked, it didn't work for me. Uh -huh. And so I think kind of just like realizing that like I didn't have any interest in sciences anymore. Like I was just like, I don't want to do that anymore after seeing like that. So that was I had like pretty great aspirations. I wanted to go to Columbia University in New York, which is like, a, it's kind of hard to get into and stuff. And so I was working really hard towards that. Um, and after COVID, my GPA dropped really low because of um, 
all the constant, just there was a lot of stress involved this year. And so um, now I don't know if that's a possibility. Halfway through the year, I was so stressed. I was like sleeping maybe four hours a day. Um, I'd go early in the morning to go to some clubs and then the whole day I'd be at school. And then after school, I'd have to retake tests. I was always retaking tests, like every test I had to retake. Um, and so that was um, kind of like a wake up call of like, do I really want to continue doing this? And um, at one point I was so stressed that I was seriously considering just dropping out of high school completely, which is insanely unlike me. Um, and so, yeah, it made me really reevaluate what I wanted to do. It also made, it, it really discouraged me rather than like, um, I feel like reevaluate is the wrong word because I feel like I could have, uh, I, I could have gone pretty far, but it was just insanely discouraging and I didn't really, um, yeah, I feel like I could have gone far, but I was just discouraged because of the pandemic. Um, I had something kind of similar happen, like right before we all kind of left forever in DMPS and I was a fully virtual student. Um, my grades did drop a little bit because I was learning AP calculus from my bedroom, uh, which was not the best thing to do. <laughs> it did not bode well for my GPA. Um, and it, it has kind of impacted me. I just built my schedule for uh, the fall semester uh, at the university I'll be attending. And one of my lectures is going to be online. And I'm already very, very concerned about that because I had such poor experiences like having to sit in my bed, teach myself um, and listen to a computer. And so I'm, I'm hoping that I'll have other students or friends or a study group to at least like watch the lecture with or something like that because I, I'm so scared of continuing online learning as I experienced in last year. So um, it, it's definitely traveled with me into my college experience already. Yeah. Is that school just staying online? Is that why it ends up being an online course for you? Um, I think college? it's just a large lecture and they found that it's easier to do, uh, to do it on the online format, which I totally understand. I, I get that it's more accessible, but I, I just don't think I can learn like that personally. Yeah. A lot of college classes are like that though, before the pandemic. It's tough. I hope that from this, like you can see that this isn't working for students and how can they take this information and, and, and change it? Because like Arushi said, so many students had a complete loss of identity through this pandemic and their goals for the future have shifted. I know that I'm so discouraged from any roles that are about social change or political change because I see that things are happening and I see that they could be better but there's no actionable change being made made towards it. And so you're completely discouraged and you feel like all the efforts that you are having, that you are doing is just being ignored. You're not being listened to and you have no ability to make a change. And so I feel like this is something that a lot of students felt throughout the year, whether they valued making a change or they valued something else in their future, they realized that that wasn't actually tangible or it didn't, wasn't actually true. And so they had to change their aspirations because of that. But you have a question. Yeah. Question for the group. And uh, one of you had mentioned that one of the things you found valuable was uh, the classroom was recorded as far as instruction. <clears throat> Were there any other examples that would be beneficial from your experiences that you didn't have previous to COVID that would be beneficial going forward in future years? The example given, well, it'd be nice to have the classroom instruction recorded so I could watch it later. Were there any other things that came about that would be helpful for the future? Um, <clears throat> There are, I guess, two things. This one is kind of harder to implement, but one is just the chat box. That little chat box really helped me so much because you have side conversations during class, but the teacher's always like, stop talking, you know? <laughs> Used to pass notes, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very blatant about my talking in class. I'm just like, I'm, I'm so confused during this, but we were able, like, we were allowed to type in the chat box what's happening or, like, ask the teacher a question without having to raise your hand and interrupt the lecture, mm -hmm. where she was able to, they were able to kind of get back to the question mm -hmm. uh, later and it was still there. And you wouldn't have to just kind of forget, mm -hmm. forget about your question before you're allowed to do it. Um, the second one was the ability to turn into students late. Yeah. Uh, the DMPS, or at least Lincoln, kind of, this is something I will, very little things I will praise them for, 
to say something. Uh, I did appreciate the ability to turn in assignments late because they said that they understood that this is a troubling time and it's hard on us um, and that sometimes things come up. And for me, I had surgery in March, so I was out like three weeks. I couldn't write with my right arm and typing was terrible. <laughs> so I was turning in assignments late because my brain couldn't function very well. So I appreciated that very much. Um, I think, so our math teacher, he recorded yeah. every single class mm -hmm. and he would post them onto a Google Classroom for us. And so if you were gone, you would just say, check the video. Or if you needed extra help, you could check the video. Like if you just needed to go over a lesson again, it was really helpful because especially like studying for our tests and stuff, I could go back and if I knew there was something I was struggling with, I wouldn't have to like go look it up on YouTube. I could see it directly from how he taught it so that it would still make sense to me because it would just like bring it back to my head. Yeah. Um, I really appreciated, um, uh, like you mentioned, that uh, sometimes classes were recorded so you could go back to it. Um, also Zoom, I didn't really know about the platform. COVID happened and now even um, in a post-COVID world, I feel like I'll still use Zoom because before that I would just FaceTime, but um, Zoom has a lot of features and stuff that I didn't know about before, so I feel like that's a cool platform. Um, I think for me, a lot of my teachers made uh, extremely specific like schedules for us, so they broke down um, the week, they broke down certain lessons, and that was all accessible to us like through mm. like Canvas at any time of day any day, sometimes like a, a week or two in advance. And so um, like if you had surgery or if you were dealing with something, you could either work ahead or work at your own pace. Um, and it was just really helpful because it was like being able to see a teacher's lesson plan, which normally like we would never have access to. And I don't think they want us to have access to those, but it's nice to see like what we're doing for the week, what kind of workload we have. Um, and it, it was just very easy to manage and, uh, and navigate. Yeah. Um, reminded me. I, this doesn't necessarily have to do with COVID as much as I think this is just how they structured it. I took an online class at DMAC this year and our teacher, I guess professor, for the second semester, he released the rest of the semester, including our final exam with three weeks left so that anybody who like needed to get it done or had something going on, like I had final so I could just get it done early. Um, could you could just get it done with and it would be you would just be finished with the class and he would grade it as you turned it in and so I think just having that ability to be able to work ahead in your classes especially if you can work at your own pace and it's not something where the, the material is being like fed to you and like you're getting taught it at from like a teacher was like really helpful because I was able to start focusing on just more of my school things that needed my attention so that was really helpful I, think I would just you know, add to your to your uh, frustration. Uh, I think we just weren't ready in any way to do what we needed to do to help you. And I think all of us are responsible, the board, the department, the teacher, and we just weren't ready to do what needs to be done. The question is, are we, are, are we correcting that? Have we made improvements? Is it getting better? Did it get better during the year? Or was it always just really difficult? I don't think it was necessarily the school that got better or Lincoln CMPS that got better, but myself, I guess, sounds very egotistical. But I thought as I progressed throughout the year, my mind and body, like I grew stronger in that way. I learned how to navigate Canvas and I learned how to navigate how I would be able to pay attention. The teachers didn't change their classes. Or if they did the nine week uh, terms, they didn't change. It was me who had to take the initiative and kind of teach myself how to navigate it. I think that um, uh, in a sense, she's right that, um, you know, it was me who kind of progressed through it, but also um, it, it did get better for the most part, but also since we had such a late start and since we have so much confusion at the beginning, it's not like it just like, utopia at the end like it's still very um everything was very cramped we didn't do a lot of labs still and we were doing like 
uh, normally what kids would learn in three days, we were doing in one class period. And so it was, it was like, although it did get better, it's not better than like or the original. Mm -hmm. um, and also I feel that um, when it did get better, although it did get better, like um, personally, you're just so uh, stressed out from how it was in the beginning of the year with the constant um, switch ups and everything that now that it is slightly better, you're still in that mindset of everything can just change automatically. And you're still in that mindset of just constantly being stressed. So though it did get better, the mindset didn't get better. How do you guys move, I guess, from it sounds kind of like a lot of you are in survival mode, right? Just get through the year. And when you live in that prolonged stress for a long time, I mean, that's trauma, right? So you all went through a traumatic experience. You've lived in a high stress, you know, period. I think a lot of people probably. And so the, the impact of that is going to linger probably. It's not just like you said, it's not going to all of a sudden the lights come on. And you're like, oh, I'm fine now, right? But how do you go into the next year with that? How do you, you know, what, what does that look like for you? Is that, I mean, assuming that I guess all schools are going to be in person, I mean, and you're back with your friends and everything, but how does that, you know, how does that look? Is that, are there things that you, you think you need, I guess, as I'm asking, what can schools provide? What can, I mean, counselors are, are what does that look like? Here? I, I can start with this one. I know I'm not a panelist, but I think <laughs> I, like this question is a really good question, right? I was in survival mode all throughout the year. I was in survival mode. I, I, I still am in, okay. until this past week. I would come home every day, not even knowing what, I, what next step I could take. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I could do. I knew that what I was trying to do was not possible. And I didn't know how to make that better. I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. And I didn't think that I could get what I was trying to do done. And so I was like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Every night, what is the point? And so I was making the little steps that the teacher had given me every day throughout the class, every day in class. I was making those little steps and doing what I was told to be doing, but I was so stressed. And throughout the year, teachers were so supportive of that. My aunt got diagnosed with cancer, um, had to start chemo treatments super soon um, without us knowing, even though we thought she was doing better um, in the middle of the winter. And so all of a sudden I went, um, from just dealing with my own personal mental health issues to also dealing with that of my families who've been completely up, like uprooted. Um, and so I was able to go and talk to my teachers and be like, hey, like I come home from school and I just, I can't, I can't do, I can't do anything. And so I need extra time to do my homework. I know that it is possible to get all of this homework done in the hours of the day that I have left, but mentally it's not possible for me to do that because I need a break. And so teachers were so, flexible with us this year and I think that flexibility like what Aubrey was talking about with turning the assignments late even though it is it is possible it is physically possible for us to get these assignments done in, done in the time period that we have is it really necessarily healthy for us to do that um in the supports that we had in school were, were really helpful in that way so I had a similar yet different experience yeah you know um I had a lot of teachers who they <clears throat> understood that we had our own personal needs and we needed to be able to care for ourselves first, but they also were moving very quickly for material and giving us yeah. a lot of work to do outside of school. And we didn't have time to go back and like backtrack through it. It's like, we didn't miss it or we had something come up. Like I just had, a, I didn't, we had teachers who were very understanding about what, like the fact that it was a serious issue and that we obviously have been going through so many traumatic events and we have a lot of mental health and emotional health problems that we need to care for before we care for our schoolwork. But they still drove us through all of that work and they didn't give us time to just slow down and give ourselves our own time, I guess. Makes sense. Um, I would say just breaks in the day. So our um, the way that our schedules work this year was they just had a lot periods. So I had four periods a day. Um, and each class was in session for two hours, and that was incredibly agonizing because it was the same subject, the same material, two hours straight, and then you move to the next thing for two hours straight. Um, 
we had about 40 minutes for lunch, but 10 of those minutes were taken away from us because they would um, shoo us out of the cafeteria really early so that they could sanitize all the tables. Um, so we had like a 10 minute passing period where we weren't allowed to eat or do anything. We just kind of like walked around. Um, and so just either, you know, like longer lunch breaks um, and also like breaks within the day. I know that there's tons of studies that show that for every 45 minutes of instructional time, if you have a 15 minute break, you're more likely to be productive. And so stuff like that, um, teachers who did give us breaks, it was only for like three minutes. And so we couldn't really relax or anything. It was more like, you know, stop the constant feed of education for three minutes and then it happens again. So breaks. <laughs> Um, I definitely agree with breaks. I also think like I would love to see more investment of like time, labor, money, energy, um, whatever is needed into like extracurricular clubs. Like when you talk about um, us going back to, to friendships, to communities, um, so many of my close relationships and the communities that I belong to have been shattered by this pandemic. And so I think like just an emphasis um, on things, things like art, things that are, are connected to our identities, things like sports. Um, I think those have really saved a lot of students in ways that we like don't even fully understand yet. But I think that's like why students continue to show up and will continue their high school careers and beyond, or if they're a little bit younger. Um, so yeah, I think I think we just can't forget those extracurriculars and those other things that like give students help and like um, give them time to relax outside of school and education. So I know I'm not on the panel, but I have kids this age, and I can and one with disabilities, and it was a nightmare for him. I mean, Canvas, he he could not figure out how to organize himself. I said I can. <laughs> um, it was super difficult. Sorry, <laughs> I was just gonna tell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was difficult, wasn't it? Yeah. That was my observation is that the ladies that we have here on, on the panel are, I would say, before COVID, probably very good students, at least average or above. The, the flip side of this is that we have students who are less than average or may have the ability but do not care for school much at all and so when we're seeing some people who are pretty solid saying they're struggling yeah. i just can't imagine the flip side of this so the kids who were struggling before covid mm -hmm. and what they what they went through i love the video of the class i think that would be super helpful going forward for especially kids with learning disabilities mm -hmm. We use that in uh, in law school. So um, I used to teach at Drake University Law School, and so we would have videos. Um, so every class is recorded, and you could request. And so some teachers left it open, um, and so you could access those videos anytime. And some didn't because they felt like students we skip out on class. And then so if you miss a class, and you'd have to email the teacher and get the video. But a lot of students said the ones who left it open, they had actually used that to study for the final exams because you know in law school you just kind of go through fifteen straight weeks, and then you have a final exam. And so a lot of them would, you know, because you can't remember stuff if you learn 15, I mean, I can't, you know, would sit there and just go through the entire videos instead of relying on their notes. And so it would help them and they could actually go through it at their own pace um, and, you know, take down notes and everything. And that was kind of their form of, of studying for the exam. And then they would go and they would do quite well, actually. It, it was very useful for all of students. Do you have a question? Um, this has been great, but you have an opportunity to speak to policymakers. And I want to make sure that everybody is represented. So do any of you have friends or acquaintances for whom online learning was safe? Either that they weren't being bullied or they weren't being microaggressed against. And how are those friends or acquaintances, how are their lives going to be kept at least as good when we come back to in-person learning? So if you're comfortable in sharing or, you know, people who's, you know, just I'd offer that up from feedback I've heard from uh, uh, friends and family. I feel like um, bullying and cyberbullying and all of those things is a completely separate issue. And I feel like that should be addressed by itself. And I feel like, um, you know, it, it was present before and kids who were bullied 
um, used to go to online school, like back when it was very rare for kids to be online, um, they'd, go, they'd be homeschooled and stuff like that. So I feel like we should address the bullying in our schools and we should address that kind of stuff um, as a separate issue rather than using it as a basis to keep online learning as a type of learning because for the vast majority of students, online learning was just horrible. Um, my brothers included, they are 12 year old boys. And so being on a computer all the time was insanely, um, I don't know, they're inclined to play games um, because it's right there. And so they've actually developed computer addictions. They wake up at like seven in the morning to go on the computer and they sleep at like 12 or um, one in the morning on the computer. And um, there was very, very little contact between the teachers. Um, this is kind of a tangent, but there was very little contact between the school and the online students. Like online students were on their own little islands. Um, In-person students were kind of on the mainland, they knew what was going on. But yeah, my, my brothers had no contact with any teachers, so they were inclined to play games. And now that's an issue on its own. So I feel like online school should not be justified by um, you know, a safe haven for bullying when bullying is an issue that should be addressed on its own. And I, I also think it's interesting that you brought up microaggressions because in my experience as a student of color with many friends um, who are black indigenous or people of color, um, online learning has not saved us from the threats and the oppression of, of white supremacy and anti-blackness and xenophobia. I've really only seen it become more violent and just find new ways of hurting specifically students of color. And so I don't think, um, I, I agree with Arushi that, that online learning is not the solution to protecting students with vulnerable identities. I, I don't see that as a, an effective solution at all because it, it's done more harm than good in my opinion. Yeah, all right, we went a little bit over time, is there? Anything? I think you're. I just have one small. Yeah, I, I want to make sure that you guys all have. This is the elephant in the room. You have masks. You're wearing masks today. Is that something that we required you to do, or is that a choice that you made, or is that what's happening in the environment you're in? I'm not fully vaccinated, so I, yeah. I choose to okay. wear my mask. I just received my second shot on Sunday, so I'm also not fully vaccinated. Okay. So I received my second shot last week, but this is also out of protection of my family who have compromised immune systems. Uh, yeah, one of my parents is extremely immunocompromised, and I drove two and a half hours for my vaccination. So I am fully vac vaccinated and have immunity, but I still just choose to wear mine. And I wore my mask. I'm not wearing it now because I want you guys to see what I'm saying. But I wear it throughout the day because my aunt's going up to Mayo for a stem cell transplant this week. Um, she was in the hospital for two and a half weeks last week because of a fever. We don't know where she got it. And so walking into school on that last week of school, not knowing who I sat by, if they had been vaccinated or not, was the most stressful time of year. It was way more stressful than the first day of school. And I know that I can talk for a lot of other students who felt the same exact way. And it was extremely polarizing to walk into school and to see that. I was texting with my cousins and with my brother who are both middle schoolers throughout the day, who were in classrooms where people would rip the masks off of their faces. They would cough in their faces. I mean, these were my brother's friends. And they couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't move in their classrooms, knowing that they would go home to my aunt's house to spend the night with her. They have to wear masks in their house because if she picks up even a little thing, I mean, she was in the hospital for two and a half weeks, but she wasn't exposed to anybody. And so that was an extremely stressful experience for all the students who, I mean, we don't have an option of who we sit by in class. Um, and so having the option to wear a mask, I mean, it protects, it protects other people from us and, and it doesn't do good. My kids had no issues wearing the mask, but they were like, it's so weird because you're just walking by people and there's no emotion. And it's because they were in class the whole time their school was in, but then they would come home and it's just like, oh, mom, it's just so weird because you, you don't, you can't see the emotion on your friend's faces, even though you're in person. And I think it's really cool because we've we developed ways to look at people's eyes yeah. and like yeah. smile at them or wink in them in the hallway. And like yeah. you've picked up on how to how to read their eyes. And I mean, I'm fully vaccinated now and there's peace that comes with that. But still knowing that two of my mom's nurses were fully vaccinated and they, they got COVID again. So it's not 100 percent. 
Um, and it's just an extra security to make us feel safer in school because when, when you don't feel like you can go to school and stay physically healthy, then how are you supposed to learn? So yeah. I know on that first day when we, it was that day that we, the mask mandate was dropped, I there were a lot of people in our school who were making fun of those wearing masks when it wasn't as much reciprocated the opposite way. Yeah. Because I can respect somebody for making the option to not wear a mask, but seeing as they can't respect my choice to wear a mask, just kind of was like, and I just know that it was probably, that was like the most stressful time of year. And I just wanted to go home the entire day when usually I'm excited to be at school and excited to see people because I don't see them any other time of day. Um, my dad and my brother both have uh, lung issues. And so, um, especially when uh, towards the beginning of the year, um, I was very scared of even hanging out with friends or doing anything. And it was that like compromise of, you know, either I can have some sense of identity or, you know, my, my brother and my dad, <coughs> because if my, my dad is in a lot of risk groups. So if he got COVID, it was like, um, pretty likely that he would probably die from it. And so it was like, you know, is it my dad's life or is it my sense of identity? And it was a constant um, battle in my head of like, what's more important and what's a bigger um, struggle. Mm -hmm. And those parents don't want to be the ones taking that ability for their students to go out and do things away, right? Like my aunt's like, go out, do all the things that you need to do. I don't want to be a burden on you because of the state that my physical health is in. But of course, we want to take care of our family and we have to make that option daily. So, yeah. Is there any last questions that you guys wanted to ask? Thank you so it's much. Very really yeah, yeah, thank you so much for organizing. For sure. You did a great job. Awesome. Wow. Thank you. Quick. So you want to come back at two back at like no, it's two thirty. It's two thirty. Two forty. Two forty. Okay, five right. minutes. Okay, we're gonna take a break. We'll come back at two forty.